Good morning. I'm Meg Kilgannon. I'm a senior fellow for education studies at Family Research Council. It is such a blessing to work with such a wonderful organization on behalf of parents and children all over the country. Just to give you a very brief story about how I got involved in this, uh, in 2015, a full year before the Obama Department of Education released its guidance on transgender policies, my school board in Fairfax County decided to add sexual orientation and gender identity to the non-discrimination policy. So I, you know, was just, a, I was a mom. I was blessed to stay home with our four children and, and uh, be a full-time wife and mom to my family, which is the best job in the world. And, <laughs> And I, I heard as I was washing dishes, I always listen to the news on the radio, and I heard this described, and I thought, well, it's a good thing we live here close to Washington, because I'm sure a lot of people will come here and tell them that that can't possibly be constitutional, and it would be very dangerous for children. But as time went on, I realized that really nobody was doing much of anything about it. So I had to start going to school board meetings, and I had to stop going to choir practice. And I made a vow that someone was gonna be sorry for that. <laughs> so, when I would invite my friends to join me in this fight, explaining to them that we would be forced to use wrong pronouns for people, that boys would be on girls' sports teams, and teachers would be forced to violate their conscience, whether they just had a simple belief in the, the true biological truth that boys are boys and girls are girls, or if they had a religious faith that, that believed the same. Um, they would say things like, well, I can't say anything because I work for the government and my job will be at risk. But what I also heard was, you know what, this is too crazy here in Fairfax. We're going to move. And do you know where they moved? They moved to Loudoun County. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I would say at the time, you know, this is a spiritual battle that knows no geographic bounds. It's coming to Loudoun. It's coming everywhere. And so it's even here in Georgia. It's even in Florida, as you're going to hear from our two wonderful panelists. Um, what happened to Wendell Perez's daughter is what we all feared and knew was possible when this, uh, this, this whole situation got started. So when anybody asks me to run a panel at FRC, you have to know you're going to hear from a parent. Um, so we have Bernadette Broyles, who is a Harvard-trained attorney. She's the founder of the Child and Parental Rights Campaign. Uh, she's the president and general counsel. She that organization is here specifically to defend parental rights and children's well-being against gender identity ideology. Uh, and she's, you may know her, she may seem familiar because she's had various state appointments here in Georgia. Um, and then Wendell Perez is a dad, a Catholic, faithful Catholic father and attorney who lives in Florida. And so we're gonna talk about what happened to Wendell's fan family and, and what's being done about it. Wendell, thank you so much for being here and for speaking out because it is difficult to speak out about this. So could you just tell us what happened to your family, what happened to your daughter? Sure. Um, beginning of this year, um, my wife and I received uh, a phone call from uh, our daughter's elementary school. Uh, we had to go there to deal with, uh, uh, with the situation. Uh, our daughter attempted um, suicide by hanging in one of the school bathrooms. <clears throat> they said, we, we wanted answers, and the school said that it, wa it was due to a gender identity issue, that uh, she wanted to be a boy, and that, that we would never accept due to our Catholic Christian faith. Um, that was a surprise for us because our daughter, there was no indication at home that she was having any problems, she was, that she was questioning her biological sex. And um, after that, I mean, we uh, learned that they were having meetings and other interactions with my daughter 
involving the use of uh, fictitious male name and pronouns um, without our consent, without our knowledge. Um, due to the nature of the situation that day, they, uh, they put my daughter in a police car, took her from the elementary school, uh, from there to the hospital, and she was uh, admitted into a mental institution. They took her, took her away from us for over a week with minimal contact until she was uh, released under our care. Um, as you could see, she was being transitioned in secret, and our faith was used against us. They decided that our faith, because we have uh, a Christian faith, uh, that was not safe for our daughter. So they decided for us. And I'm going to be honest with you, um, my blood still boils up to this day. Um, and after that, we had to pick up the pieces and start a very painful healing process as a family. And part of that process was that we filed a lawsuit against them. <laughs> for the for violation of our parental rights and other constitutional rights, and that lawsuit is still active in federal court. Thank you. And I think it's important to remind everyone that when you say that they were talking about your daughter, the people at the school were probably referring to her as your son. Yes. Okay. Which is why we needed Vernadette. <laughs> so Vernadette, can you tell us about the lawsuit that the Child and Parental Rights Campaign has filed on behalf of the Perez family. And is this an isolated incident, or hmm. is this happening other places? Oh, Meg, I wish it were isolated. I wish we didn't have to exist. But when we found out about the Perez's um, complaint, their, their situation, uh, we were gobsmacked at the temerity of these school officials. And so we have filed a lawsuit with um, a whole variety of claims, but starting with our constitutional fundamental parental right. The United States Supreme Court had announced almost 100 years ago that parents have a constitutionally protected right to um, direct the upbringing, the education, the care of their children under the 14th Amendment. So that was our, our first cause of action. Um, but in addition to that, under the Florida Constitution, there are similar rights, and that is also the case in most of our states, inclu including in Georgia. But then also there is uh, a Parental Bill of Rights in Florida, so we brought the Florida um, statutory claim as well. And it is now pending in the uh, Middle District of Florida. But no, this is by no stretch isolated. In fact, just the opposite. We are hearing from parents literally all across the country. There are lawsuits now that are pending. We have another lawsuit in Florida in the Northern District, similar. We have another lawsuit pending in Massachusetts where it's two children that were targeted by the activists there and were transitioned secretly over, and this, over the objection of parents in that case, specifically. There are lawsuits pending in Maryland uh, we were involved in an Oregon lawsuit, California, um, Wisconsin. We've just learned, well, we have known for a while in the state of New Jersey, their state policy is to keep this information from parents. In Wisconsin, excuse me, in Michigan, they just de determined or elaborated policy again to put it into the hands of a minor child as to whether their parents are going to be informed of them being transitioned at school. And let's be really clear. This is not a neutral intervention. First of all, it's a mental health intervention that school officials are not competent or qualified or authorized to make. But even worse than that, as Meg knows, social intervention almost inevitably in high percentages leads to medical interventions, 
chemical and physical surgical changes in the child. And what does that do? It, it interrupts the healthy development of a, of a child's body. For many children, it sterilizes them. It robs them of their human right to have children themselves someday. Infertility, lifelong sexual dysfunction, we can go on. So these school officials are doing this behind parents' back across the nation, right, including and in Georgia. <laughs> and they lack the medical training to make those kinds of long-lasting, lifelong decisions. This is done on the basis of being an ideological activist yes. in many, many cases. So Wendell, back to you. There are probably a lot of parents, including in red states like Georgia, who uh, may hear about instances like this when school officials are essentially abusing, they're definitely abusing the children and they're abusing the parents in the process. Um, no one can fault a parent who's in a crisis situation as your family found themselves in for, for focusing just on their own family. But you, were, you had the, the bravery, the courage to, to make a stand, to, to keep this from happening to other families. Can you talk to us about your decision to do that? Yes, well, to all the parents out there, if you're in a similar situation, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. They're counting on that. Um, just remember that you have the right, you have the parental right, the schools, the school, they have responsibilities. They are the government. They respond to you. They are there to be an agent for the parent. They, we do not co-parent with the schools. So the message must be clear. We will do anything to protect our children and to defend our families, and we will never back down. As a mom who has fought alongside many wonderful fathers in this fight, it is just, isn't it a wonderful blessing to have fathers stand up for children alongside mothers? Thank you. So, so, and I just want to, to, to just briefly describe your family. You're, you're married to your wife, you're both the parents of your children, and you attend church every Sunday. You're not a marginalized family, right? No, you're, we're, you're, we're you're, not. We, we've been together for 25 years. We have two children. We are practicing Catholic. We practice our faith. We're not like some politicians that say that they're something <laughs> and they don't practice. <laughs> so... Um, we do practice our faith. We try every day to glorify the Lord by our lives. So this is, this is by way of saying that I think sometimes we can think that this is happening to other people. This doesn't happen to people like us, people like us who, who are, are good people with their lives in order. And we want to make every sure everybody knows that we're all at risk because of this. Um, it's, 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 we have a duty to fight for the children, any child, right? But we have to remember that even our own children are not immune from this, this battle. So speaking of, um, of situations where people say one thing and do another, at the federal level, Bernadette, um, <laughs> what would the recent actions by the Federal Department of Education, what implications does that have for this situation and the issue generally? Right. You know, I just want to make sure that I also mentioned that the Paris has had a very excellent free exercise claim that we brought as well, because what this school did, and I, I promise I'll answer your question, but this is really important. What the school did clearly violated their religious liberties, their rights to free exercise for their child. So that is also constitutionally protected. So getting back to the federal government, what the Biden administration, and, and again, we're a nonpartisan organization, but we just have to call the balls and strikes as we see them. And what this administration is attempting to do now through its federal Department of Education, it had put out a notice of proposed rulemaking rule in July. The comment period closed on September 12th on Monday. And that was to change the regulations that implement Title IX. That Title IX, as you know, was the um, amendments to the Civil Rights Act back in 1972 that ensured that discrimination on the basis of sex is prohibited. And the purpose of that was to ensure that girls and women would have equal opportunity in education and including in sports. Well, now these proposed rules would gut that. 
because it would expand the scope of Title IX now to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Gender identity and sex are mutually exclusive because gender identity overrides sex. It subordinates biological reality to the imagined or the psychological perception and identification of, of an individual. So this effectively would require schools and school officials to immediately and unquestioningly affirm and endorse any child who asserts a discordant gender identity contrary to the biological sex without question, and nowhere in these regulations, the whole thing was 700 pages long, nowhere was there a requirement for parental notification or the consent of parents. So what that means is that the de facto policies that these schools have been instituting without the backing of, of actual uh, statutory authorization would then actually be now authorized by the Federal Department of Education's new regulations. And so we're at a place where we have to make some decisions about taking a stand. I will tell you that private Christian schools are not safe because we just had two decisions rendered by a federal court in California and a federal court in Maryland stating that to have a tax exempt status alone is tantamount to federal funding to require you to be subject to the Title IX rules. We cannot withdraw and hide behind our religious walls. We simply cannot do it and abandon the rest of our culture to this torment and this distortion of the created order. And so we have to make a decision now to take a stand against what our federal government is attempting to do. Great. So, Wendell, what what would you um, what would you ask of pastors, parents, how, and concerned citizens? How can they engage with you in this fight and and stand up to protect our children? Yes, um, we need you. We really need you. Um, this transgender identity uh, movement is actually a movement of confusion. And confusion is not from God. We, for over 50 years, we did very well defending the child in the womb. It's time to defend our children outside of the womb and defend our families. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you that we are members of that body is something special, something powerful. That body is the church. And I believe in that promise when our Lord said that not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. So, whatever fight we put together in his name, victory will be ours. Join us. That's a tough act to follow, but Bernadette, what advice do you have for pastors, parents, and concerned citizens? You know, I have several. And the most fundamental of which is to become present to our schools once again. Be present by being servants. I'll tell you, that's what the other side has done. They have gone into schools and have offered all kinds of assistance, including, cl including secret closets to put clothing for children to change into to appear to be the opposite sex that their parents would not see, okay? We understand that this is coercive and, and distorted assistance, but even still, they've come in and have offered to serve. Well, we need to come back in and be present by being servants to our schools, number one. And, when you, and see, when people like you, our presence, and whether it's pastors or, or just people of faith and good conscience, we're present then we're able to affect the atmosphere. We're able to release what's within us, the truth that is within us, even if we don't say a whole lot, but just our very presence. But the second thing we need to do is that we need to look in our congregations or in who we're sitting with and identify those who are, are laboring in the schools, teachers, 
you know, uh, administrators or parents that are dealing with in their schools and come alongside them, help them understand if you do the right thing, if you follow truth, you won't be alone. We'll stand with you because you'll be defriended, you'll be, you'll be attacked, you'll be called every kind of hateful thing, but to know that we will stand with you. Okay, and can I talk about voting? <laughs> real quickly, right okay, right. real quick. So the last thing is we need to make sure that we educate our congregation and our fellow citizens about where candidates stand on parental rights and on biological truth. And so that we encourage, we get our, all our fellow citizens out to vote, but that they vote wisely in accordance with what we know to be true. Thank you. We have our... <clears throat> We have many resources online for you at FRC. Our 30-day prayer guide for schools is there, and any day is a great day to start 30 days of prayer for our nation's children, families, and schools. We also have resources at frcaction.org schools if you're considering running for office, running for school board. Um, and I just would like to thank you so much, Wendell, for your bravery and speaking out. You're, you're benefiting so many families. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Bernadette, for your work. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much.